Let me introduce myself and then perhaps for our viewers, you could introduce yourself as well. Um, so <clears throat> I'm here in the States and um, I'm actually up in Washington State, which means uh, I'm uh, about 100 miles from Canada uh, and about 30 miles from the state of Idaho. So we're out on the West Coast. Uh, we have a company here uh, in uh, Spokane, Washington. We are what's called a design distributor and we make home exercise equipment for people who are recovering from shoulder surgery or are trying to avoid it altogether. Uh, we help between 200 and 250,000 patients a year with home exercise devices, um, both via our Amazon store through traditional uh, channels, as well as our uh, brick and mortar channels to hospitals and clinics. And then finally, uh, through our online store with our own website. And uh, we've been in business since 1990. And uh, we like to think of ourselves as being the authority on shoulder pulleys, but obviously you can't be talking about shoulder pulleys without talking about shoulder pain and without talking about what's causing all this shoulder pain. And that's why two of my coworkers found you at the BASES conference. Now, I wonder if you could uh, tell us uh, and for our listeners, we have about 20,000 subscribers, physical and occupational therapists, mostly in the States. If you would tell us a bit about your medical background and how you happen to be speaking at this conference. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm sorry about that, but I was in the middle of a clinic and here in Malta, it's uh, illegal to be anywhere without a mask. So. I understand. Thank you. Um, basically, um, uh, I've been involved in the traditional sports and exercise medicine for the past uh, 20, 25 years. And uh, a few years ago, uh, working mainly with the uh, Maltese Olympic team. So I've been to the Commonwealth Games, Olympics, Mediterranean Games, and numerous other games, um, as I'm uh, the chair of the medical commission. But I also work in, in, in soccer and football, and you at least is football. And uh, as I'm the medical director of the Malta uh, Football Association. So you're but a medical, uh, you're a medical doctor? Yes, an MD with a specialization in sports medicine. Okay. And uh, it's been uh, done, you know, a few years ago. Malta is being projected a lot as a um, digital, digital uh, uh, island and uh, AI island and, and gaming island. So uh, automatically we, we uh, got more involved in, in, in the online sports arenas. Mm -hmm. And uh, that led to esports. So and a couple of years ago, I had a conference organized in Malta. And one of the guest speakers was uh, the organizer of the Basis Students Conference. And we started talking, I did my keynote, and, and that was that. And we kept in touch. He was super intrigued by this. I mean, a few days ago, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, announced that they are getting involved in during the Tokyo Olympics. The, with you know esports as well, so it's it's a, it's a massively growing um, field of sports, especially with this pandemic, where more and more gamers are being introduced to different types of games, and that's why I got involved. Um, growing market background, more, I, you know, I'm seeing more and more patients uh, relate, who, who who game regularly, so one thing led to the other right place at the right time or or wrong place at the wrong time it depends how you look at it because <laughs> it's increased significantly in my workload but yeah. well are you uh you, you mentioned the pandemic and i certainly that's a an interesting twist on the pandemic so 
sports-minded people discovering uh, esports, competitive esports, and then spending a lot of time there. Um, I, I'm I'm gauging your age, and I wonder if you're an esports player or if you're kind of a more from the traditional soccer and and other kind of activity yourself. No, I'm I'm um, more traditional. Um, uh, I gamed a bit when I was younger, but uh, it was becoming a bit too time consuming okay. and didn't work very well with my studies. So I had to do a conscious effort to, to, to stop. Um, in those times, there wasn't the possibility of becoming a multimillionaire in my teens. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> and nowadays, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a profession. Let's be honest. It's a profession. Yes. And uh, that's where it all started, because when I got involved a few years back, I looked into it and uh, there's no research on it, minimal. Most of the research out there is related to addiction. Yes, that's from uh, rather than to the hope taking care of the whole uh, welfare of the, the, the gamer you know, or the video player. It's, it's, uh, and, uh, you know, the studies are really lacking. We, we've done a few reviews. Um, I'm one of the editors of the International Journal of Esports, which is research oriented. And uh, we, we did, there's a big lacuna of, of, of info and data out there. And in fact, both of the information we, we have is a correlation of people who do, who get overuse in, in their factory, in the factory workers or, or, or sedentary um, uh, office workers, uh, you know, too much uh, using of the, of the uh, you know, mouse or, 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 or uh, typing or regular same repetitive movements in, in, in the factories. And we, we saw a correlation with that. Um, you know, but, you know, Nintendinitis, the term was coined, you know, three decades ago, even more. So uh, it's significant that not enough research was done. Maybe because mainstream research and mainstream grants uh, were not available at that time. Why now with, 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 with university and university teams with, with, with certain countries like the States and, and, and Korea offering scholarships for, for gamers, um, uh, sports scholarships, you know, it, it's, it's a, a rapidly changing scenario. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, unlike traditional sports where you, you know, me, the medical back, background, the medical support services, the welfare um, of, of the support around the players and athletes grew with the sports. Esports has just exploded so fast that there, there is that uh, we're not we're playing catch up and we're not doing too well at it. And what's really worrying on, on my part is that um, we're losing a, lot, a number of pro athletes at a very young age. Their lifespan from a professional pers perspective is, is, is low. You wouldn't expect a, a top athlete to, to, to retire in, in, in his 20s. But that's how they do it, uh, from a combination of physical and mental burnout. And uh, are we addressing this enough? No. Should we be addressing them enough? Yes. One, because it's, it comes from the, the stakeholders in the industry that's important that they take care of these things. Secondly, if us in the industry don't take care within our, our, our uh, setup, you know, the authorities will come and, and impose it on us. We've seen this in other fields, directly or indirectly. You know, they might not directly be related to sport, but we've seen it in tobacco, we've seen it in alcohol, we've seen it in, 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 um, in gambling. Um, and when uh, these uh, industries refused to, to self um, to self administer themselves, they, it was imposed on them. I was seen it in traditional sports when cycling wasn't was having a very 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 bad image with with, with doping. It created the the the, the foundation the, the the independent foundation to take care of doping for it. Same with international sports. That's where the World Anti Doping Agency was created to take over the, 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 the doping scenario. You know, they, they, they took the, 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 the challenge, they, they, they grabbed the bull by its horns and, and, and tackled it. And what really worries me is that one day someone, countries, uh, lawmakers will just 
put their foot down overnight. Say, ah, too many people are addicted. Too many people are dying. Too many people are, have bad, bad lifestyle uh, choices. And uh, you have to do this. You have to do that. And the result will be an imposition um, rather than uh, us being disposed to, to, to change and, and, and positive um, uh, changes for the welfare of, of the practitioners. It's going to be imposed upon us. And when something imposes, especially with the majority of the age group people we're, we're dealing with, you're going to have issues, major issues. And uh, I, I wouldn't want anybody to have to... Re, uh, to overdo it. You, you must think, looking at me, previously with the mask, now with the safety belt, you must think I must be the safest person in town. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is I, had to get, I, I was delayed in my clinic and and, uh, and had had to find a quiet area. And the other quiet area was in my car. <laughs> so here I am. Sorry about the safety belt. <laughs> I can take it off, I'm not driving. That would, that would be the ultimate. <laughs> <laughs> the addiction question certainly is an interesting conversation, but I want to see if I can move us into the conversation about the kind of injuries you're seeing when, when you both talk at conferences and when you see people in your clinic. Where, where are the problems showing up, uh, first of all? Right. Um, there are a couple of um, review studies and small studies that showed quite clearly that we're dealing with almost a three-tier me uh, medical, let's talk about medical physical issues. Let's forget the addiction and the mental issues. And the three-tier one is, is, is one is general musculoskeletal problems. The next would be um, health in general. And the other is, is ocular or, or eyesight. So Let's talk mainly about the musculoskeletal aspects, okay? We're talking about overuse injuries. So in the upper limb, we tend to have a lot of, of uh, overuse injuries of the wrists, you know, trigger fingers, the queer veins, you know, synovitis, tennis elbows, uh, golfer's elbows, um, vague shoulder pain, carpal tunnel, any type of problem you would normally associate with overuse. Then you have the, the added issue of, of postural issues, where these people tend to um, slouch, crouch, uh, have um, improper um, body po uh, positions for long hours a day. You know, at the pro levels, these guys train up to 14 hours a day. You can you imagine a, a, a hockey player or, or, or a basketball player training for 14 hours a day? It's, it's, a, it's impossible. Yeah, these guys, especially in competitions, they can go, go on for days with breaks, so yes. Um, but also with, with um, uh, these, the top people do 400 movements, up to 400 movements per minute, which is ridiculous if, if it's on a mouse or a joystick or, or, or the keyboard. That's a large number of movements, very finite, very small, being imposed on, on a, a small number of, 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 of uh, muscles and joints. It's, something's going to give. Yeah. Now, something's going to give. So in, in my practice and in what we've found out so far, those are the most common issues. Um, but on the other aspect, uh, the health issues cannot be not taken account of. For example, um, um, uh, lifestyle uh, issues, physical activity, improper nutrition, overuse of, of, of uh, performing uh, drinks, usually sports drinks, that, they push you, they push you, they push you, they push you wow. to, to last these 14 hours, um, which all have their health risks. And unfortunately, it's some, some, some studies and some rumors are that they're taking even performance enhancing drugs um, to stay alert, stay vigilant, to keep on going. Okay. What do these uh, translators is more health issues in a young population. And lastly, as I mentioned, the ocular, you know, fatigue, uh, tiredness, early use of prescription um, uh, specs, uh, glasses, you know, all these have been uh, associated with, 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 with long, long hours facing a, a screen. So we're not really, really saying anything out of the norm. It's just that this particular group of athletes have taken it to the next level. And that's a younger, a younger age group. Yes. What is the age group? Where do you see the band? Oh, you get pro. You know, you get 
you know, Fortnite was won last year or the year before by, by a teenager. And a prize money of over a million dollars. Well, the Tour de France is six hundred thousand dollars. So you know, you got you grown grown men who've been doing that sport for 10, 15 years, and um, battle it out for three weeks. Get six hundred thousand. You win a tournament of, of a few days, and you win a million. So you know, the 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 the, the prize uh, when you reach the top is is uh, is amazing. So uh, there's a big incentive. And you know, if I could have, if my guy, my kid was a, a gamer and, and could become a pro, I would. I honestly cannot say he, uh, I wouldn't discourage him. I just ensure that uh, the other elements of, of uh, wellness in his life are, are taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. We, um... What about depression? I mean, when you have fatigue and pain, you got to have some overflow into mental health. Drink, copy, scan, or Hello. Uh, your microphone is off. There. It's your microphone is on for a while now. It's on, but it was yeah. off. Go ahead. Oh, nice. Well, um, so mental health issues go hand in hand in any sport. However, in this age group and in this um, particular sport, it hasn't been adequately catered for. In pros, in teams, in professional teams, forget the top players. We're talking about a number of, you're talking about million of gamers who are pros or semi-pros or almost there, who haven't made the grade but are close to, who are training hard, maybe in, by being in, 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 in proper nutrition and in proper health, Obviously, having a stress is related to, to their teen, teen years. You, it's 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 an explosive mix. mix. Yeah, and you and you're just asking for problems. Yeah. Well, I thought I thought perhaps I want to move to therapeutic exercise, which is of course our area of interest. Um, in Malta, do you have uh, physiotherapists that are associated with your clinic, or do you refer to physiotherapy? No. Um, I do both. I mean, as I'm with the Malta Football Association and with the Olympic team, we have our own setups. Okay. And um, for traditional sports. Um, when it comes to general practice, uh, we, we refer, uh, our government service, we refer to physiotherapy teams. Okay. And, you know, we are, my, in my profession as a sports and exercise medicine consultant, I'm worthless without a good team of musculoskeletal. Right. therapists of various forms. I, I, I work with different teams coming from uh, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, chiropractors, osteopaths. So I work with all, uh, all yeah. orthopedic surgeons, uh, podologists. We, we all work together. It, it doesn't work otherwise. I mean, if you want to give a good service, uh, my job is to diagnose and maybe find out underlying conditions, underlying issues, but no one is going to, they will definitely deal with them better than I would. So I work very much hand in hand with these different colleagues of mine. Um, and to be honest, uh, Malta has the benefit of being multinational. So in our different clinics, we've got people from, you know, Greece, Italy, Serbia, Lithuania, Ethiopia, uh, UK, different countries, a lot of Maltese, obviously, a lot of different countries, different traditions, different backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get physiotherapists who are more hands-on, other physio more manual therapists. You get physios who are more exercise rehab oriented, others who are more machine oriented. It's amazing how they get, you find them all mixed together in the same setup and they just cross refer. Yes. And they, it's, it's uh, the patient that benefits, let's be honest. Well, you've got, the you've got the pain, but then you've got the underlying causes of the pain. Exactly. Exactly. And um, so you to address that, is there any simple things? I, I don't want to say simple, but 
if you saw someone who was trying to break into professional sports, is there anything you might be telling them uh, in terms of just uh, movement? Um, what are what are your do you have? I, I imagine you have a uh, protocol that. Uh, you my sorry, Mr. the last piece. No, I, I would guess that there's something you say to every one of them. Hey, I want you to, okay. to do this. Two, two things. Two things I always tell them: choose the right coach, and listen to your body. Good. Um, and to be honest, uh, it's not always that easy, because sometimes you don't choose your coach, and sometimes you cannot listen to your body. Right. But you know, I. I worry more about the younger athletes because the elder athlete, the, the more established with a decade of sports under their belt, listen, and they know when when uh, when enough is up. Okay, I'm not hearing you. I think I've lost. You might you may have driven out of cell phone range a bit. I've got oh, okay. the, I got the video, but you were you were saying. The professional athletes uh, might listen a little better than the younger ones. Yes, um, because they've learned the they've learned the hard way. You know, to reach a stage at that level, they've got the experience. Like everything, you know, in our in our profession, experiences, books teach you a lot, but it's hands-on uh, day-to-day experience that really gives gives you knowledge and how to adapt and how to improve. Same with 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 sports. Um, uh, the more experience you get, you get, the more matches under your belt, the more you adapt. Right, right. Then there's the other element that uh, um, they get used to the pain. Right. Now there's good pain and there's bad pain. And then depending on what sports, uh, you, you know, when you have to listen and when you, uh, and when you can ignore. I mean, in, in gamers, uh, a mild tendonitis or tendinopathy of, of a small tendon of a small muscle in the wrist can be carrier threatening. Same with if, if that is a, the, the throwing arm of, of, of a pitcher or, or a quarterback. Right, right. Yet, if you're a running back, who cares? You know, I mean, that's the honest truth. Yeah. Strap okay. it and get going. So you have to... It's not... How can I say? Decades of experience teaches you how to adapt and decades of experience teach you that you never know enough and you know when you have to refer and ask for advice. When you're dealing with these young athletes, do you deal with their parents as well? <laughs> Next question. Ah. <laughs> the truth is that parents can be the best thing in town or, or the biggest obstacle. Yeah. They can have unrealistic demands for their child. Um, they can have be the biggest supporter, but they can be the big, biggest de detriment as well. Yeah. Um, uh, especially if they're, they're also the coaches or, or they're building their own success stories on, on or success hopes on, on, on their kids. Yeah, and, and uh, having said that, without good, good support service, including parents, most at least wouldn't arrive anywhere. So that's right. It's, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. You try to bring the parents in into the picture with the physiotherapist or the chiropractor or the occupational therapist, or is that too difficult? Um, within reason. Within reason. Yeah. You don't want your parent to be on the coaching. Okay. So you don't want the parent treating. But you want the parents to be involved in the treatment. Right. So, they, at the end of the day, very often they accompany the kids. They, they come with them. They're, they sit down in the sessions as well. But if there's a home-based rehab, it's the parents that are going to be the ones overseeing it. So if you can recruit them, have them on as additional therapy staff or treatment staff, it's a bonus. Yes. It's a massive bonus. Also, you know, you can communicate, usually you can communicate better with parents. 
it's just that not all parents see the same things. And it's not easy. It's not easy. I mean, they're, 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 they're an integral part of the equation. But if you don't work it out well, they can give you the wrong results. Right, but if you can get them to interrupt like you talked about, if, you're, if, the, if the young person is spending that many hours a day, if the parents can help with an interruption, get them to stand, get them to move, and, and have that mild influence, bring them a peanut butter sandwich, you know. <laughs> of, of, of an athlete, of, at any age, the, 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 the family life, is an integral part, be it the, the, the partner, be it the parents, they are more likely to be doing most of the home-based work for them. Um, maybe this sounds a bit traditionalist, but it's the reality as well for the majority of, of, of athletes. Okay. So if you don't recruit them, if they're not part, part of the, if they're not part of the solution, they can be part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. They will become the problem. So yes, get them on board, get them on team athletes and, and, and drive. Better having them with you than, than against you, that's the honest truth in, in all aspects. Yeah. Finally, let's talk a little bit about uh, gender, male and female gender. Um, right. I had five boys, I have two girls. Uh, I certainly, in seeing the children grow up, the, the, male, the males were more interested in the online sports games and video games. Is that still true or what's the situation now? Uh, the truth is, you know, the gender inequality in, in top sports is there for all to see. And it's not any different in esports. Um, yet, and there's a drive to have more, more, more girls involved, more females involved, and we're getting there. It's, you know, like in all sports, it's, you know, soccer up to 20 years ago was, was a male dominated sport. Nowadays, uh, Look at the U.S. Uh, national team, and the, the women are getting all the results. Yeah, yeah. Not the, not the paychecks apparently, but the same results. No, yeah, the results. After the viewers, how about gender uh, uh, in terms of different kinds of upper extremity or postural problems? Are you seeing any general gender-related? Um, to be honest, to be honest, there aren't enough numbers out there. There's enough data out there. Um, I would. Hazards to 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 uh, guess uh, or just or uh, guess them it that, that I, I don't see there'll be much difference because at the end of the day it is a sedentary sport you are sitting down for most of it some stand um, and this might change in 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 in, in uh, with this evolution of VR virtual reality gaming where we're seeing more and more uh, physically active. Uh, sporting events oh and maybe the little little physical superiority of the male can can make a difference from performance and maybe even reduce injuries but we've we'll got to see yeah. still at the early, early stages well um i'm hoping for more research here as i can tell you are generally my experience has been there has to be some assistant professor who's trying to publish or perish and at that point, they find a topic, and we have to find them. Trying to influence people to research our topics is not nearly as successful as finding the people who've already taken an interest and then find, and then getting them out in the open, you know. You know, we, we were seeing that. We were seeing a lot of studies come out of um, uh, New York and, and uh, Germany and, and Korea and uh, quite popular in Asia. And also the UK is building up. So we are getting there. It's just, I, I believe it's we, we're, we're at the beginning of, of, of a massive, massive um, uh, plethora of, 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 of uh, research coming up. In, because uh, let's throw it. Once there's a research and interest and money is being thrown at it, you, you'll be surprised at how many people are, are. And it's original. There's nothing out there. So you're more likely to be published. So uh, well, we'd, li we'd like to build some sort of home exercise kit for the online gamer. And um, we just don't know what to put in it yet. You know, uh, 
Oh, they're, 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 I think I think you have to find a, a juxtaposition kit. One is one health related, and one will be game related. One that that is a multi multi usual that would aid you become more physically active, even if it's a simple app. Okay, yeah. and the other one would, would be MSK related, which is uh, basically. Uh, you know, from from your um, uh, resistance cords to to your fingers finger stretch stretch cords to shoulder uh, mobility, um, uh, and you have an app because listen, this is the app generation, and these are the people who use the app the most. You supply them with the kits, make them uh, have an app that tells you how to use them, how to adapt, and according to what games you're playing and whatever, which which is more useful to you. You know, you work it backwards. What are the most common problems? Trigger fingers, carpal tunnel, tennis elbow, shoulder. Those kits already exist. Just package it for the gamers. Package for the gamers. Yes. Okay. It's it's not reinventing the wheel. It's just packaging it differently. Repackaging, remarketing to a new target. Yeah, and I'm probably costing it two times as much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't seem to be. They don't seem to be conservative in their spending uh, when it comes to these things. Yeah, but let, let's be honest. Uh, that, that was a joke. Um, most gamers don't make it great. So, uh, um, uh, but if it can help one more, one more person not get an injury, it's always worthwhile. And collectively, they are spending more now than on professional sports tickets. And so... It is, it is a big uh, influence, but in, incrementally not big. And of course, our interest is in helping uh, with their pain. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much. Could you pronounce, thank you pronounce and spell your name for us? So my first name is Kirill, K-I-R-I-L-L. -L. It's a Russian name. Don't ask, ask my mother where she got it from, but it's Kirill. Okay. My surname is Mikhailev Safraj. Mikhailev is... Uh, um, Malta is, is right in the middle of the Mediterranean. Okay. We're uh, 100 kilometers south of Sicily and around 200 kilometers uh, north of uh, Tunisia. So my surname is, is that. Mikalif is, is North African. Safrach is, is Sicilian. So more, more, more geographically correct surname than that, uh, you cannot. And, and Kirill is Russian. The Russian, Russians are everywhere now. So perfect. <laughs> The medical de designation, do we use simply MD uh, as your medical de designation? That's fine. Uh, I've got a lot of not earned rubbish behind my name. MD is fine. Okay. Well, we're very thankful for you taking this time. It must be like six in the evening there or something. It's 7 p.m., yeah. And, and gosh, do I wish I was there and you were here because I could use a little more warmth right now. How how cold is it there now? Yeah, last night I think we had thirty three degrees Fahrenheit. So. Okay, uh, I'm I'm a centigrade guy, so here it's uh, here it's we're just off, but it's tw about twenty six degrees centigrade. We had to cover the tomatoes last night. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, here we've been swimming for a month or two, so let's uh, see. We very much enjoyed our conversation today. Thank same you. Same here.